That's the sound of the Yurok tribe of Northern California protesting dams on the Klamath River. The Klamath is just one of many rivers in the western U.S. that's become the site of a major movement to breach hydroelectric dams. Large dams are seen as a major impediment to the survival of salmon, orca whales, and other aquatic species that are vital to cultures and economies. From the Snake and Columbia Rivers in Washington and Idaho, to the Klamath, Eel, and Matillaha Rivers in California, indigenous activists, environmentalists, and fishing communities are leading the charge to demolish dams and free the rivers they depend on. My name is Kyle Baker. I'm a filmmaker currently on coronavirus lockdown in Santa Cruz, California. Like a lot of people right now, I'm trying to figure out how to do my work through the pandemic. I'd been planning a film all about dam removal in the Columbia River Basin, but that's been put on hold indefinitely. I was thinking about how to make progress from quarantine, and in early November, some news broke from my hometown in Southern California. The Ringe Dam in the Santa Monica Mountains on the western edge of Los Angeles County was approved for removal after a nearly 30-year wait. Uh, Ringe Dam, it's actually quite a high, it's a 100-foot um, high concrete dam and spillway, and it is in uh, Malibu Creek, which is critical steelhead habitat uh, in Southern California. That's Sandy Jacobson with Caltrout, an organization that oversees a statewide initiative called Dams Out. Caltrout identified Ringe Dam as one of five in the state that needed to be removed. Uh, it's about three miles upstream from the ocean, so it blo- everything upstream of that, in terms of steelhead habitat, um, is blocked. They literally can't get there. And not only is it harmful to endangered steelhead and the health of the whole watershed, but the dam has been entirely defunct for decades. The Ringe family early on wanted to uh, construct a small reservoir, and the structure was finished in 1926. And by 1960, the, um, it was filled in with sediment, it was not functional, and uh, it was decommissioned. The Ringe Dam is a prototypical example of the kinds of obsolete dams that are being removed all around the country. In fact, in 2015, it was reported that in just 25 years, the United States had removed around 900 dams from American rivers. Compared to large dams in the Columbia River Basin that still generate electricity for huge urban centers, where the debates around replacing a carbon-neutral energy source are complex and sticky, removing the Ringe Dam seems like a piece of cake, right? Wrong. Like with everything, there's a lot of different viewpoints, but I think some of the most salient ones are, first, is that people downstream, those that oppose it, are typically concerned about their property and about flood, uh, of being like the sediment coming down in a big uh, uh, clump and screwing up the waterway, the, the beach, their property, something like that. And as Barbara Tejada, a cultural resources manager for California State Parks, tells me, some folks even want to preserve the dam for its historical significance. We had one um, person who was a descendant of the Ringe family that, that was pushing strongly to keep it. Um, we did find that it's eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. So we, we acknowledge that it is a significant historical feature. So what's going on with the Ringe Dam? Why is it taking so long to remove? What are the real benefits or pitfalls to such a project, and why should we care? How does it fit into this broader movement to breach dams, and in what ways does it differ? Well, for starters, it was built by a woman. The Ringe family bought the Rancho Malibu um, in 1892. The husband was Frederick Hastings Ringe, and his wife was May Ringe. And so, you know, they bought it because it was beautiful. It was kind of going to be their weekend home, but they were going to use it for ranching. And Frederick Ringe, he suddenly died in 1905. And his, um, his wife, May Ringe, was kind of suddenly left in charge. But she was quite the character. She was very capable <laughs> of, being, of being in charge. And when uh, Frederick died, they were in the process of building the first version of the Malibu Pier. And the whole reason for the pier originally was, you know, they were cattle ranching and stuff, so they would import and export stuff from, you know, from the ranch. Rhoda May Knight Ringe, known as May, 
oversaw the completion of the Malibu Pier. Turns out she also fought off the Southern Pacific Railroad from coming through Malibu. They had um, come across kind of an obscure uh, law that said you can't have two different railroads in the same spot. So they actually, the Wynn family actually decided, well, we'll build our own railroad to keep the main Southern Pacific out and we'll just use it to transport stuff from one end of the ranch to the other. So um, May Ringe completed in 1908 a 15 mile small railroad. It was called the Wainimi, Malibu and Port Los Angeles Railway. And they used it until about 1922. So it was, it didn't use it too long, but it was good enough to keep the Southern Pacific out. So fast forward a couple years. Frederick Ringe has been dead a while. May is really running the show at the ranch. Starting about 1913, the, the Ringe family had um, constructed little, a little diversion dam and flumes up in Malibu Canyon. But the ranch operations continued to increase, and they had some tenant farmers that would um, farm that lower plain for uh, flowers and vegetables and things like that. So they needed more and more water. Mayringe ends up hiring a geologist and an architect to design the dam, and she oversaw its completion in 1924. Since they had stopped using it a couple years before, they actually dismantled the railroad and used the rails as the rebar for the dam. So it's unique in its construction, um, and uh, they incorporated 231 um, 30-foot-long steel rails from the railroad. So between the dam and the railway and the pier, this May Ringe character already sounds so influential to Malibu. She's eventually nicknamed the Queen of Malibu for fighting tooth and nail to preserve the ranch from wider development. Why am I just hearing about her now? And wait, there's even more. Barbara Tejada tells me that around 1907, May Ringe starts putting armed guards at the gates to the ranch to keep the public out. In 1916, the county filed an eminent domain suit against her because they wanted to build a road through the ranch. Looking out over the coast highway, the scenic route to San Francisco, you begin to realize why this is frequently called the American Riviera. The lawsuit went all the way up to the Supreme Court in what is today cited as a landmark eminent domain case. Mayringe eventually lost the case, and the Roosevelt Highway, today known as the Pacific Coast Highway, was built through the ranch. And Mayringe's ferocious legal battles started adding up. You know, lawyers cost money even back then. (laughs) So she was always looking to diversify her income sources to be able to support this fight. And, and, um, you know, not only did she start renting out cottages in what would become the Malu Colony, that was rich into beach houses for, for celebrities. <laughs> and, um, but she also built the, um, the Malibu Tile factory. Um, and so that also helped bring in some income. <laughs> Despite the irony of Mayringe developing the area more in order to pay for her fight to keep the ranch undeveloped, I can sort of understand an argument to preserve the dam as an historical site. It's one of the last standing monuments to this woman's legacy. I'm sad every time some, something historical <laughs> has to go. But um, in this case, I see how the bigger picture, it, it, you know, it makes sense. So what is the bigger picture? What's really behind the push to remove this dam? I called conservation biologist Rosie Daggett to find out. So when Frederick Ringe bought the land that is now Malibu Creek State Park and where the dam is. He bought it in like 1898. And he wrote in his um, autobiography that the reason he bought this property was because of its great trout stream. And he describes the fact that, you know, visitors would sort of appear at the ranch and they'd all of a sudden need to feed 30 people for dinner. And they could just send folks down to the creek and get enough trout whenever they needed to, to feed whoever showed up. So you kind of get a sense of the abundance that occurred at the turn of the century. 
Rosie and her team have been researching steelhead and advocating for their recovery in the Santa Monica Mountains for the past few decades. In 25 years, there were 177 steelhead. That's it. That is it. That is a perilously low number of steelhead. The removal of Ringe Dam immediately opens miles of suitable spawning habitat. And that's really critical to the recovery of the species. At present, steelhead only have three miles between the ocean and the dam as spawning grounds. When we take the dam down, they will immediately have access to an additional six to 10 miles of creek. We will not get anywhere close to the 60 miles of stream that the fish had before the dam and all the subsequent development, but we'll be up at around 20. And aside from providing miles of habitat for endangered fish, dam removal would help the watershed as a whole. Here's Sandy Jacobson again with Cal Trout. One of the major things that dams do is block natural sediment transport. It's really important to bring sand down into the, um, into the estuaries, into the coastline. So it's how you replenish it. It's how you build your, uh, your beaches that will be more resistant to erosion, but actually it helps people protect their property as well. So it has an economic and an ecological benefit. And as Rosie Daggett reminds me, it's not just steelhead that would benefit from dam removal. We have other sensitive species that are not listed as endangered, but for which Malibu Creek is a critical uh, habitat. Things like the Southwestern, Southwestern Pond, Pond Turtles, turtles the California, California Newts, newts Two-Striped two striped Garter, garter snakes. snakes. It used to be a big stronghold for Pacific Lamprey. And then down at the lagoon itself, we've got the Tidewater Gobies. So restoring the health of Malibu Creek by removing the dam benefits all these creatures, not just the steelhead. This is all great, but it seems that one challenge in getting the public behind a project like this is that most people don't necessarily think or care about sediment transport regimes, watershed connectivity, or even steelhead. What they do care about, undoubtedly, is how much does this dam removal project cost? So this one will be over $200 million. That's That's the bottom line on that. Wow, that's a steep bill. There are a few different plans in the works through the Army Corps of Engineers and other players, but what is seemingly being adopted is what's called the locally preferred plan. Sandy Jacobson explains. So the, the locally preferred plan involves removal of the dam, the spillway, <clears throat> and then um, trucking the, the sediment uh, up and around, and it'll then be barged down into Malibu for offshore placement for um, kind of resiliency and protection of the, uh, of the coastal area. That last part of the plan sounds almost comical. The city of Malibu has raised concerns over construction traffic in the already congested Malibu Canyon and PCH corridors. So the sediment will be scooped up by a claw, trucked out of the canyon, driven about 40 miles up the highway to the Ventura Harbor, only to be placed on a barge and carried back down the coast to the Malibu shoreline. I would not be surprised if a um, a better solution came out of this before before we get to that point. It's been nearly 30 years since Congress signed off on the initial appraisal process to remove the Ringe Dam, and the seemingly ridiculous and expensive plan was the best federal and local agencies could come up with. All the while, steelhead and other species are 30 years closer to extinction. I was ready to point my finger at pathetic bureaucracy and a lack of political will. Isn't there some way, like public pressure, for instance, that these projects can move along at a more reasonable pace? No, I don't think so. You know, I just th- think that uh, that these are really large, complex issues, and it takes it takes really good organization and finances to make them happen. And so it requires a lot of technical studies to achieve a certain level of confidence that it can be done safely, that it will be done safely. So that's one of it is just kind of just the magnitude of the problem. The second is there are a lot of stakeholders to get everybody on board, thinking along the same lines, agreed, Uh, functioning as a unit is really difficult. It just takes years to do that. Third is funding. So putting these funding packages together because they're expensive is difficult. And also kind of the, the (laughs) the cherry on the top of this is to have somebody in Congress that is just completely an advocate for it. 
that they can help make things happen. And so there is some form of political um, uh, benefit that is that really helps um, a dam removal process happen. And you just saw that. You just saw that with the Klamath. Jacobson is referring to the Klamath River dams that are finally moving forward with removal since Oregon and California's governors both stepped in in late 2020. In considering all of the ecological, historical, and political issues wrapped up in dam removal, Jacobson and others have given me a new appreciation for the complexity of these projects, even one as seemingly small as the Ringe Dam. The two-pronged approach of restoring as much access to habitat as we possibly can, and then recognizing that these few refugia upstream wild populations need to be protected and carefully managed at all costs so that we don't lose that genetic history. Those two things together are what's going to be needed in order to recover steelhead. One or the other alone is probably not going to do it. So removing dams like Matillaha and Ringe, all of these cumulatively create sort of like a string of pearls along the coastline, giving these ocean-going fish options on places that they can go. And that's really the key to recovery. As of November 2020, the Ringe Dam feasibility study was signed off on by the Army Corps of Engineers. The project has a long road ahead, still needing the green light from Congress for necessary funding, and certainly with more public debate from downstream communities in the near future. But Rosie Daggett is hopeful. We have the opportunity to turn around and fix mistakes that we made that we didn't know we were making necessarily, but the unintended consequences have been dramatic and very challenging for many other species. And yes, the numbers of fishes are very low, but they're not gone yet. And if we take action and make this happen, we give them a much better chance of coming back. And that's something within our power to do. We can't necessarily fix, you know, acidification of the ocean or, you know, overall climate change. But we can fix this. We can remove Ringe Dam and we can make this better. And it's not an easy thing to do, but it is something we can do. And I think it's worth it to take those opportunities when they come our way. I'm not even going to try to top Rosie Daggett here, but I wanted to close out with a plea to those who might find themselves opposed to removing the Ringe Dam, either now or in the future. A plea to imagine the Malibu Creek that Frederick and May Ringe saw, a creek teeming with fish and with life. And imagine in just a few short decades, all or most of that life went away. And I get it, it's expensive, but we have a responsibility to the land, to the water, and to the creatures that we live amongst. And if we're unwilling to pay to remove this dam now, it'll be the fish and all these other creatures that'll pay later. I'd like to thank Rosie Daggett, Sandy Jacobson, and Barbara Tejada for their time and ongoing work. Also thanks to Danielle LaFur at State Parks and Russell Marlow at Caltrap for their time and help. A big thank you also to the Seventh Generation Fund for Indigenous Peoples for providing archival tape. This piece was produced by me, Kyle Baker, Music by my friend Mucky the Ducky, with additional music by yours truly. Special thanks to Elisa Huff for the editing help. Till next time.